network of UNC faculty with wider communities beyond the university. And in addition to diverse events here in Chapel Hill, we have collaborated on a series of programs at North Carolina Community Colleges, which is called the Sydney and Mary Shockett Family Series on Jewish Life and Culture. And we share a belief that the humanities are essential components of public life and public education at all levels. So we're glad that you have joined us this evening. And I especially want to welcome those of you who are teachers, North Carolina teachers, because I know that there is now a component on the history of the Holocaust in the North Carolina state curriculum. So we're very pleased that some teachers are with us this evening as well. Our speaker, uh, Christopher Browning, currently lives in Washington State, and he had planned to visit UNC last April as the Ullman Family Distinguished Scholar to give a couple of talks, as well as a seminar for graduate students. But that event had to be canceled because of the COVID crisis and the suspension of public programs. But we're very happy to have Professor Browning with us today. And he met earlier this week also with a group of uh, UNC graduate students. So we want to thank all of our friends and generous supporters, including the Ullman family, for helping us to make these kinds of events possible and to continue the general discussion of the humanities and history. I will introduce Professor Browning in a moment, but I first want to ask my colleague, Ruth von, von Bernuth, to offer some comments on behalf of the Center for Jewish Studies and to explain why we have the Ullman family programs at UNC. Ruth is the Seymour and Carol Levin Distinguished Term Professor at UNC, and she's on the faculty in the Department of Germanic and Slavic Languages and Literature. She's also the director of the Center for Jewish Studies, and it's always a pleasure to work with her on collaborative projects. So I welcome you, Ruth von Bernuth, into the Zoom room. Thank you, Lloyd, and, and welcome everyone. Good evening or good night to some of you. Um, 15 years ago, uh, in October 2005, the Carolina Center for Jewish Studies in cooperation with Carolina Public Humanities, launched the first two-day Jewish Studies Continuing Education, a seminar open to the general public. So we actually celebrating 15 years, we didn't imagine this would be a virtual event. Um, this series was made possible by a generous gift uh, from Tom Ullman, who holds a doc doctorate in political science from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. The topic uh, of the first Ullman seminar was escaping the Holocaust and starting life anew. And this to topic does not only connect with today's topic, but also connects with Tom's family history. And I want to mention briefly here, Rudolf Ullman, Tom's father left Stuttgart, Germany for the United States in 1934, when he became clear to his parents that the rise of Nazism posed a bleak future for him there. Trained to become a judge, he had, he had been banned from working in the courts as was the case for all Jews. Upon arrival in the United States, he first learned English and then studied American law, receiving degrees from Cornell and Harvard University. Hilde Egersheimer Ullmann, Tom's mother, also left Germany in 1934 after attaining her high school diploma and joined her parents in Istanbul. Her father was a highly regarded doctor and he had been recruited along with other Jewish scientists and physicians by President Mustafa Kemal Atatürk to modernize Turkish institutions and education. After spending several years studying in Turkey, Hilde Ullmann lived in England where she worked as a governess and in the U US consulate until 1941 when she arrived in the United States. Tom and his family have been strong supporters of various programs at UNC, and we are all very grateful for his support. Thank you, Ruth, for your comments about the Allman family and the special recognition that we want to give a shout out for to Tom Allman, uh, a true friend of the public humanities. 
Now I want to introduce our speaker for this event. Christopher Browning is the Frank Porter Graham Professor of History Emeritus at UNC Chapel Hill. He completed his undergraduate studies at Oberlin College and then went on to receive his PhD at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. He taught history at Pacific Lutheran University in Tacoma, Washington for about 25 years before joining our UNC History Department in 1999 as the first Frank Porter Graham Professor, a position he held until his retirement in 2014. Chris has remained a very active scholar and teacher since retiring from UNC, and he continues to write influential articles in publications such as the New York Review of Books, as well as scholarly works on the history of the Holocaust. I should also note that Chris, as we've always called him in the UNC History Department, was a great colleague, and his courses on the Holocaust always drew large enrollments. He's the author of eight books, including the work that provides a starting point for today's presentation, Ordinary Men, Police Battalion 101 and the Final Solution in Poland, first published in 1992 and now translated into many languages. This book remains a major work in historical discussions about the motives and actions of people who committed the murders for Germany's Nazi regime during the Second World War. His other notable books include The Origins of the Final Solution, The Evolution of Nazi Jewish Policy, September 1939 to March 1942, published in 2004, Remembering Survival Inside a Slave Labor Camp, published in 2010, and a recent co-authored book entitled German Railways, Jewish Souls, The Reichsbahn, Bureaucracy and the Final Solution, which has just appeared in 2020. Professor Browning has received many awards and fellowships, and he was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 2006. He has also been much engaged in public humanities work. He has testified as an expert witness at Holocaust denial cases in, in courtrooms, and he writes about current events in the New York Review of Books. Drawing on his knowledge of European history in the 1930s and 1940s to explain how knowledge of that era can help us understand present day conflicts and the challenges of authoritarianism. The title of his talk today is Ordinary Men Revisited, The Evolution of Holocaust Perpetra Perpetrator Studies. And I wanna mention that we'll have some time for questions after the talk. So you can submit questions through the Q&A tab at the bottom of your Zoom screen. This is the way we're going to have a conversation in the age of COVID. So now I'm pleased and honored to bring Professor Chris Browning into the Zoom room for his talk. And please join me in welcoming Chris Browning. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, Lloyd and Ruth, uh, for the invitation and the chance to come back to Chapel Hill, even if uh, virtually rather than in person. Uh, I was very sad that uh, the visit last April, of course, could not come off as, as we had planned, but uh, very glad that uh, we can at least have uh, some form of substitute uh, uh, via the Zoom room today. Uh, in revisiting ordinary men, I wanted to talk in a sense about three phases of uh, the historiography that revolves around the book. Uh, first, the origins of the book, how it came to be written and the initial challenges. Uh, secondly, the criticisms that uh, the book uh, elicited and the debates in the 1990s after it was published in 92. And then at the end, uh, where what directions have things taken since the turn of the millennium uh, in, ter in terms of more broadly uh, perpetrator studies uh, that uh, no longer so much focus on ordinary men, but at least have been uh, in a sense uh, developed as a result of those earlier discussions. In terms of the origins of the book, 
uh, it begins really in the late 1980s. I was visiting uh, the Central Agency for the Investigation of Nazi Crimes, a judicial agency in Germany, because uh, they had all of the uh, ver all of the verdicts and all of the indictments uh, for any a national socialist crimes trial that had occurred in Germany in the previous, uh, basically the three previous uh, three decades. Uh, and I was there trying to uh, look at uh, any of this material that related to Poland uh, to try to fit in the map uh, for myself on, on Poland uh, in terms of what uh, German trials had uh, revealed to us uh, after uh, the Nuremberg trials and the so-called Nuremberg document collections, which had already been well utilized. It was in the course of that that I came across an indictment of Reserve Police Battalion 101. Uh, and two things struck me immediately that, uh, that I had come on something that was very unusual. Uh, and it was one of those kind of historians days in the archives, a kind of eureka moment uh, when uh, you realize that after years of plotting, uh, you had uh, made uh, a significant uh, discovery uh, that would open up uh, new avenues. Uh, two features of the indictment struck out. The first uh, stuck out. The first of one was the relating of the speech given by the commander of the battalion, uh, Major Trump, uh, before the, the battalion's first massacre uh, on July 13th, 1942 in the village of Yosefuf. And the battalion commander uh, basically explained to the men what they were going to have to do. They had never done this before. And at the end gave the remarkable offer that any of the men who did not feel up to it uh, could step out, turn in their rifles and not participate. Uh, here I had, in all the years I'd been re researching, I knew that people who had not wanted to shoot and tested the system, that is asked to, to, to be uh, excused or demanded to be excused, got away with it. Uh, but I had never seen anywhere a open and explicit offer by the commander of the unit inviting the men in effect to not take part if they didn't want to. Uh, and uh, this uh, was crucial because it meant that the standard alibis that all of the men giving testimony uh, for the investigation, uh, typically coercion or putative duress, that even if they wouldn't have suffered terribly if they had not shot, uh, they didn't at that time know they wouldn't have, uh, uh, were now gone and that the men would have to explain uh, their actions uh, in a much more realistic way, because this uh, offer of the commander became basically uh, the standard operating of the procedure of the battalion throughout its long stay in Poland, that basically no officer could force any of the men to shoot uh, if they didn't want to. Uh, the second thing that stuck out uh, in uh, the indictment was the quotations of very graphic testimony. I'd read many courtroom testimonies and most of them were quite uh, transparent uh, and mendacious lies. The men simply denied uh, they weren't there that day, they were home on leave, they were uh, have KP duty and they were cooking, uh, any number of different ways of saying they weren't there when the killing took place. Uh, and that most of these were, were clearly uh, false testimonies that were being given. And even those that uh, admitted to being there uh, would give very bland, very uh, uh, flat, non-exact uh, descriptions of what had taken place. And here I was reading descriptions that were graphic beyond belief, that were basically explaining what the battalion did uh, in the most horrific detail, uh, hiding uh, virtually nothing. And I'd simply never seen anything like this in a German court record. Uh, so I knew that I was on to something and I resolved to go to Hamburg where the actual trial had taken place uh, to see the entire court record. Uh, and after uh, all the uh, lengthy paperwork that by then it was required in Germany to get access, uh, I was allowed into the records. Uh, there were some 30 volumes of testimony uh, taken from some 210 members of the battalion. Uh, which meant that over 40% of the battalion uh, was uh, in, interrogated and investigated uh, in the 1960s, 20 years after the events under investigation, which for an historian, of course, is a remarkable sample uh, to have over 40% of the unit uh, testifying 20 years later uh, is, uh, is, uh, is 
is extremely exceptional uh, under any circumstances and under these uh, especially so. Uh, working through uh, all of that material, uh, a number of conclusions uh, emerged. Uh, one was uh, that uh, certainly for uh, the, as I said, for the for the offer that that the major made in the first day, that remained standard operating procedure. That remained operative. Uh, that for the rank and file that were in this unit. Uh, if one were trying to characterize it, I would say that they weren't even a random sample of German society. If you were trying to find a collection of men least likely to become killers on behalf of the Nazi regime, it would have resembled the group of men in this battalion. Uh, and let me explain that further. Uh, one, their average age was 39 and a half years old. Uh, that in 1942, the Germans uh, expanded the age for obligatory military service, uh, but uh, the army didn't want people in their 40s. Uh, and so those who were old enough to be conscripted, but still too old to be desired by the army, they were sent off to other duties, such as the reserve police. And so uh, that this intake of, of cons conscripts uh, in 1942 was basically a man averaging very close to 40 years old. So they were too young to have been in World War I. They were not brutalized by trench warfare. They were too old to have been socialized in Nazi Germany. They did not go to Nazi schools with Nazi curriculums. They were not raised in the Hitler youth. Their formative age was during the Weimar democracy period of the 1920s. They were not raised in the Nazi bubble. Uh, they knew a different world. They knew different standards. Uh, and uh, so uh, uh, they were, in a sense, uh, a group that fell between the barbarization of World War I and the Nazification of the 1930s. Uh, secondly, uh, they were mostly working class. About two thirds of these people were unskilled working class. Uh, if you did skilled work, if you were a machinist making submarines in Hamburg, they didn't send you to Poland, they left you working on submarines. But if you were an unskilled worker, a truck driver, a warehouse worker, a uh, restaurant waiter or whatever, uh, you had no uh, military job that was essential to the war economy, uh, and uh, you then could be conscripted uh, uh, without, a without an economic exemption. And thirdly, uh, they all came from the area of Hamburg and its environs. And Hamburg was a city that had been fairly uh, uh, unreceptive to Nazism. Uh, the Nazis referred to it in the period of the coming to power as Red Hamburg because uh, the Socialist Party and Communist Party were very strong there. The labor union movement was very strong there. And the Nazis had a hard time making a go of it because those were the organizations that had been more capable of resisting uh, the siren call of the Nazi uh, campaigns. Uh, certainly the Nazis were a cross-class party and many workers did join them, but not in the same proportions as upper middle and lower middle class. Uh, and uh, that the parties most resistant to the Nazis were the socialists, the communists, and the Catholic party. Virtually every other uh, group on the political spectrum was vacuumed up by the Nazis, but socialists and communists uh, more or less held their own. Uh, so in terms of geographical origin, Hamburg, in terms of age, roughly 40 years old, in terms of social background uh, workers, uh, these men were collectively, in a sense, the least likely group in Germany uh, to uh, become uh, killers on behalf of Hitler. Uh, other uh, conclusions that I made from this, when they were sent to Poland with very little training, very little indoctrination, uh, and thrown into uh, the mass killing of Jews, their first action was at uh, Josefów in mid-July. And it was for them utterly traumatic uh, that this came as a shock. Uh, they didn't know how to make sense of it. Uh, many of the men were very distraught about what they had been asked to do and had most of them attempted to do. Very few had taken up initially uh, the uh, major's offer uh, to not take part, that they were traumatized uh, and uh, that uh, the descriptions they gave in part reflected, uh, I think quite accurately, uh, the degree to which this had been uh, a traumatic experience. What was one of the most discouraging conclusions from the material is how quickly they moved beyond that. 
how rapidly they got used to what they were doing. And people who had been traumatized at the first massacre all too often became uh, quite root, uh, routinized, quite numb, quite uh, a, a, insensitive uh, to killing uh, in a very quick period of time. Indeed, I concluded that over the next months as the battalion was sent to a number of shooting actions or to actions where they rounded up people in ghettos, put them on the trains uh, to be sent to the nearby death camp of, of Treblinka, uh, that the battalion roughly broke into three groups. Some of the men who I termed the eager killers were men who learned to enjoy killing other human beings. Uh, they, they, they liked what they were doing. They enjoyed what they were doing. They volunteered for what they were doing. They came back from the killing fields to joke about what they had been doing over a good lunch, uh, that uh, this was something that, as I say, uh, they became eager about. A larger group uh, were those that I would call the uh, accommodators, uh, the compliers, uh, people that did what they were told but didn't volunteer, didn't seek the opportunity to shoot other defenseless human beings, uh, but nonetheless uh, never uh, took up the major's offer not to take part if they were explicitly detailed to such an action uh, they went along. And finally, there was a third group that I termed the evaders, uh, who either on the first day or sometime later uh, took up the major's offer and said, I can't do this anymore. And they would excuse themselves from the direct shooting, the direct killing of other human beings, but nonetheless still continued to do the other activities that facilitated what the battalion was doing. They still served in the cordons around the killing sites. They still served in the ghetto roundups that put people on the trains to Treblinka. So that even while they didn't directly shoot and kill other human beings, they nonetheless helped the battalion's uh, overall uh, task uh, by doing the ancillary functions that were also necessary uh, to carry out and complete the battalion's killing actions. Uh, I also uh, concluded basically that in, in terms of, uh, of, of people trying to explain why they had done what they'd done in terms of the compliers, uh, the most common explanation uh, was uh, simply to tell their interrogators, well, uh, they had done what they'd done because they didn't want to be thought cowards and, and weaklings by their comrades. Uh, that uh, the need in this I mean, they're, they're a small unit of 500 men in occupied territory. Their only social grouping, their only social support is in the battalion itself to break with their comrades, uh, to not do their share, uh, to leave the dirty work to their comrades. It was a very asocial act uh, and one uh, that uh, they, uh, difficult uh, and many of them simply decided it was easier in fact to go along easier to kill other defenseless human beings uh, than to take up the major's offer. And those that did take up the offer, the evaders almost invariably did not explain or couch what they were doing in terms of opposing the regime. They didn't say, I can't do this because it's immoral. I can't do this because this is murder. Uh, they would say, I can't do this because I am too weak uh, or that I can't do this because I have children. Uh, and in effect, they were uh, finding the space where they could evade from taking part in the direct killing without challenging or criticizing either the regime or their comrades. They were taking on themselves the onus of being too weak and thus insidiously uh, legitimizing, uh, validating uh, those who were killing as the tough guys, the good guys, and they were the weak guys, the weak link. Uh, but uh, that was the carrying that stigma was the price they were willing to pay in order to excuse themselves uh, without putting themselves in opposition to the regime, the regime's policies, or in a position of criticizing uh, their comrades. So uh, even though they didn't take part, they kind of indirectly validated what uh, their comrades were doing. Uh, and took on the onus of being uh, too weak uh, to do their share. Uh, it did turn out another conclusion I reached was that they, the, the most primitive division of labor, simply not putting the gun to the head of someone and shooting them directly, but still taking part in all the other actions, the roundups and uh, the cordons, 
uh, created a, a, an extraordinary sense of distance or lack of responsibility for what was taking place. Uh, even the most, uh, you know, that simple act of, of doing everything except pulling the trigger uh, in a sense, allows themselves psychologically to kind of remove themselves from any sense of direct responsibility. As long as somebody else was shooting or uh, the people they put onto the trains were gassed by somebody else at Treblinka, 60 miles down the railway track, uh, they could go on doing what they were doing without feeling a sense of their own uh, direct responsibility for it. So those are the conclusions I kind of drew out of this mass of testimony from these 210 uh, men that uh, who had been investigated. And after I finished, in a sense, reconstructing what the battalion had done and the path that it took through Poland and the changes this affected on the men in it, uh, I still uh, felt uh, that uh, I needed uh, something more to go along beyond the reconstruction of the story. Uh, and historians are uh, very eclectic. We, we basically borrow from many disciplines uh, and uh, that we take many methodologies and insights uh, from, from other disciplines, depending upon what's useful. And for me, uh, in this particular case, the discipline that I could borrow from that I found most fruitful was social psychology. Uh, that uh, while earlier many people were trying to explain perpetrators in terms of themselves being psycholog psychologically abnormal, what was wrong with them as individuals, that they could do such terrible things, which obviously normal people didn't do, was asking the wrong question. And the real question was how do normal people who would never have done this on their own, acting within the framework of a group, uh, and subject to the dynamics of group behavior would do things as part of a group that they would never have done as an individual. And social psychology, of course, looks at exactly that issue. How does being a member of a group, how do the relationships within a group shape and change people's behavior? Uh, and so uh, I looked at many, uh, the, the conclusion of the book does discuss, uh, discuss a number of different uh, explanations people have tried to give, and I looked through those. But clearly, in, in the conclusion, the weightiest part of it is that that looks at those factors that social psychologists uh, had found that shaped group behavior in a way I think that the men in this battalion had been affected. Uh, they were affected by the power of deference to authority uh, to shape behavior within a group, uh, by the power of role adaptation, uh, to shape behavior and by the power of conformity, uh, to not stick out uh, and uh, to be a, a loner uh, and to be cut off from the society, uh, the small group society around you. So role adaptation, deference to authority, uh, conformity uh, became uh, in a sense the, the key factors I had found uh, that shaped the way and it helped to explain why these men had done what they'd done. Uh, even if uh, they were not ideologues, they were not highly Nazified, uh, they had not been carefully indoctrinated, uh, they had not been subject to you know, uh, long training and so forth, uh, but nonetheless uh, had become uh, a uh, quite effective and very terrible killing unit. Uh, having got that, I had the manuscript then by, by 19... 91, and so I was looking for a publisher. I had uh, written the book, very conscious that I wanted this to be a crossover book, uh, one that would have academic respectability to speak to my colleagues and experts in the field, but also be accessible to a wider audience. Uh, so I attempted to go not to university presses, but to commercial presses. Uh, and uh, to give a sense of, of how little this was regarded as a uh, a significant or interesting topic uh, at that time, uh, the first three publishers I approached turned it down. Or I should say the first three publishers my agent approached turned it down. It wasn't until the fourth attempt to HarperCollins that we finally found a publisher willing to take it on. Uh, and then uh, we had to come up with a title. And I had uh, initially thought of the title Becoming Killers, looking at the process of how these men uh, had uh, changed themselves in effect to become professional killers. 
But my editor said, no, that won't do uh, because becoming in English also has a second meaning uh, of being attractive or handsome, a becoming gentleman. Uh, and he said, if anybody can misinterpret a title, they will, uh, and we must avoid that. And then it took a long time. We kicked around a number of titles and uh, finally arrived at Ordinary Men. It sounds like a cliche now. And in fact, many people uh, sort of use that almost as a cliche now. It wasn't self-evident then. Uh, it took quite a lot while to come to that title. When we did, I think we knew we had the right one. Uh, and uh, But it was not uh, something that was self-evident or obvious uh, at the time. Uh, the book came out in 1992. Uh, and generally got favorable reviews. Uh, but there were a number of criticisms, uh, some not so, I think, grounded, uh, but a number that were important, substantive, and uh, were part of what you hope a academic book will do, that it will spark uh, a conversation, it will spark a uh, scholarly response and stir up important issues, and in the end lead to uh, new questions and to new research and to advance the field. So what I wanted to do now is talk about some of the uh, criticisms that were made uh, and where I stood on them then, and 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 uh, uh, you know what 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 in a sense the shape of the debate in the 1990s was. One criticism was against my use of social psychology, uh, that it was claimed by by, by some that social psycho psych social psychological answers uh, uh, basically uh, sort of let the person off the hook. Uh, that uh, that uh, they remove moral responsibility, uh, that they're exculpatory, uh, and that uh, to do this with Holocaust perpetrators uh, was not only bad history, but uh, morally questionable on the part of the historian uh, who would uh, employ these uh, when the feeling was by those making this criticism, uh, I was uh, exculpating, excusing the actions of uh, the killers. Uh, social psychologists themselves do write and are aware that their explanations are viewed by people outside the profession as being exculpatory as being determinative, that they seem uh, to remove personal responsibility because if in fact uh, these general forces are at work and you can in a sense predict how people will behave, that somehow these people didn't have individual responsibility, uh, that uh, the perpetrator becomes a victim of the circumstances uh, he finds himself in. I don't think that is a valid criticism. Uh, virtually all of the experiments that we have that social psychologists have done on the issues, say, of deference to authority, conformity, role adaptations, uh, always have a fair number of people who don't do what the majority do. Uh, that the famous Milgram experiment, for instance, about deference to authority, uh, that roughly two thirds of the subjects of the experiment will uh, ex inflict extreme, think they are inflicting extreme punishment on the subject at the order of a scientist in the name of scientific progress, but about a third do not. Uh, and uh, for me, the third that do not are the proof that people are making decisions, that they're capable of saying no, they're capable of exercising human responsibility. The experiments show us how to predict what, in, what the uh, aggregate is likely to, how the aggregate is likely to break down. It doesn't tell us in any way, shape or form what each individual will decide, and it's only after each individual makes its individual decision uh, that you reach the aggregate, that human responsibility is still there. Uh, and uh, the fact that about a third don't do what the other two thirds do is proof that they are capable of making individual decisions uh, and exercise human responsibility. So uh, my feeling was, was the claim that I had somehow whitewashed the uh, perpetrators, uh, let them off the hook by giving social, psycholo uh, social psychological explanations, I think was simply a false and wrong and unjustified criticism. Uh, a second criticism was, uh, well, uh, what I had written about the book and how I described it may be true, uh, but that was not a typical killing unit. And therefore, the conclusions I reached from it 
uh, could not uh, be used more widely to explain Holocaust perpetration. Uh, and that Reserve Police Battalion 101 was an exceptional unit uh, and not like most of the killers in the field. Well, at that time, of course, we didn't know much about the killing units. Uh, that there hadn't been case studies of different killing units, and there certainly hadn't been case studies of the many other police battalions uh, that were also out doing the same thing. Over 100 police battalions were engaged uh, in the Nazi occupation and enforcing its racial policies, including, of course, the killing of Jews. Uh, but we had no other study uh, with which to compare Reserve Police Battalion 101. One of the things the book stirred then was an intense study of a number of other Reserve Police Battalions. Uh, and we can now, in a sense, uh, fill in the blank spaces, and we can reach some judgment about how typical or atypical Reserve Police Battalion 101 was. And the results of that is that I can say Reserve Police Battalion 101 wasn't typical of most, uh, but that that is not going to be uh, very comforting in the end for reasons I will uh, come to later. Uh, roughly, uh, what we found is the police battalions were of three groups. There were three clusters of police battalions. One was made up of men who volunteered for the reserve police in between 37 and 39, uh, that uh, they did uh, like National Guard units, they did weekend training, summer camps. Uh, and in 1939, uh, they were uh, basically called up and placed into these 500 man battalion units, given further intensive training and indoctrination then sent out uh, to, in a sense, get accustomed to racial imperialism by becoming the enforcers in the expanding Nazi empire. And so that they had been uh, within the reserve police and subject to training and indoctrination uh, for a number of years from 37, 39 on before the first uh, killings of the final solution in 1941 occurred. So that they were veteran units used to in fact uh, becoming Nazi enforcers with a fairly high percentage of Nazi party members in them. Uh, and uh, they were younger. They were basically men in their, uh, in their early 30s. Uh, the ex next group were even younger than that. In 1939, when the war breaks out, uh, the army asked the police to provide them with a large cadre of military police, what we call MPs. And so a number of career policemen were simply transferred from the police to the army uh, to be units of MPs. And in return, the police was allowed to select from a pool of, uh, of, of, of volunteers for the SS uh, to take, not into the SS, but to take into the order police. So these were men in their late 20s. They were much more Nazified. Uh, there was selection. The, the order police could choose among a large pool of men whom they wanted. And they too were subject to long periods of training, indoctrination, uh, occupation experience before they were thrown into the, the killing fields of 1941. By 1941-42, of course, the Nazi party, uh, uh, empire is at its vastest expanse. Uh, the, uh, they're now deep in Russia with demands for ever more manpower. Uh, so when they lift the age for compulsory military service uh, in 1940, late 41, early 42, uh, and people in their late 30s and early 40s can now be conscripted, uh, many of the younger men of the earlier police battalions uh, are sent off to other things. And Reserve Police Battalion 101 was totally restocked with these uh, rank and file uh, who were all novices now without past experience, older in age, not particularly Nazified. They didn't, they didn't have a Nazi party membership any more than the average across Germany. Uh, and there isn't time to indoctrinate. There isn't time uh, to, uh, to give them extensive training. Uh, and uh, there certainly isn't the opportunity to be selective. They're at the dregs of the manpower pool and they're grabbing every man off the street that doesn't have a essential economic uh, exemption uh, that they can lay their hands on. These people are sent off to Poland uh, then as virtually raw recruits and thrown into the killing. Uh, and the question is then what happens after that? 
we now know uh, from the work of German historians, uh, in a sense, we can construct a list uh, of the body counts of all of these battalions. How effective were they and which were the, more, the most uh, prolific killing units? And even though Reserve Police Battalion 101 was, got a, was behind in terms of a year, many of these units started killing in 41 in Russia, Reserve Police Battalion 101 doesn't come to Poland until late June of 42, doesn't start killing until mid-July of 1942. Even though it is, as I say, not made up of men who are indoctrinated and trained and notified and carefully selected and have long period of kind of acclimatizing to uh, Nazi occupation policies, uh, even though they're thrown in a year later than most of the other units, among all the several hundred some German police battalions involved in the final solution, the fourth most uh, lethal battalion in terms of killing was Reserve Police Battalion 101. Uh, and uh, so while one could say it was not typical, uh, that's even more frightening. What it means is that in fact, even without selection, even without notification, even without special indoctrination, even without lengthy training, even without the brutalization of prolonged occupation experience, this unit could zoom past many other killing units much longer in the field with all of those other attributes and become one of the most lethal killing units uh, in the German order police. Uh, so to the answer, is it atypical? My answer is no, Reserve Police Battalion was not typical, uh, but that is no uh, uh, salve to the no notion that ordinary men cannot kill. It makes the lesson of Reserve Police Battalion 101 even more frightening. It shows us, in fact, with even out all the other factors many people assume for either a necessary or sufficient precondition for creating a killing unit, without any of those Reserve Police Battalion 101 could still become the fourth most lethal reserve police battalion uh, in uh, the Nazi empire participating in the final solution. Uh, another criticism that was made was that my book ignored the issue of ideology or downplayed the issue of ideology and particularly anti-Semitism. Uh, and indeed in, 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 the, uh, in the 90s when a book uh, written by Daniel Goldhagen uh, called Hitler's Willing Executioners, using the same battalion and using the same archival materials, uh, came out four years later with an utterly different thesis, basically arguing that uh, these men were not ordinary men, they were ordinary Germans, but to be an ordinary German meant that you were in the grip of an hallucinatory eliminationist anti-Semitism, whereby uh, you wanted to kill Jews, believed in the justice of killing Jews, and did so with gusto and joy. Uh, those are his words. I'm not making up this vocabulary. This is what he, he the words he used. Uh, basically, he said, I've gotten it all wrong, uh, and uh, that you had to understand the, the ideology of these men, their fanatical anti-Semitism, and my book then was viewed as uh, the situational, organizational, institutional position versus his ideological, cognitive anthrop or, or, uh, you know, ex explanation. Uh, and uh, it got shaped, uh, even though I had not intended my book and, or described it that way myself, we got put into that binary opposites. Uh, and uh, I think uh, people then, because his explanation was so in intensively based on ideology in general, but anti-Semitism in particular, my book was then viewed as underplaying this and the opposite one that relied on situational uh, explanations. Uh, and I think one of the most constructive things that came out of the debate uh, was a contribution by the social psychologist uh, Leonard Newman, who said that's a false dichotomy. That's a, that's a false binary. In fact, you cannot separate ideology uh, and perception on the one hand uh, and situation on the other. Uh, perception or situation is not uh, a, a fixed neutral thing in which everybody in it simply then uh, is, is reacting to the same things. Situation is constructed. P 
people come to a situation and they will interpret that situation. They will read that situation. They will understand that situation they are in depending upon uh, the perspective, the cultural assumptions that they bring with them. Uh, and that uh, some people uh, in this situation will read that situation differently than others. So that culture and situation cannot be separated. Uh, that uh, indeed, if you took uh, as, uh, people from, uh, you know, Italian soldiers, for instance, we know, uh, put into these situations behave very differently than German soldiers did. And there was indeed uh, a cultural uh, difference in the way that they read uh, the situation they were in and, and did behave differently. So here, I think we, we uh, something that I wasn't smart enough to be able to articulate when I was trying to sort out all of this in 1992, in response to the drastically one-sided criticism that we got from the Goldhagen book, uh, I think Leonard Newman came up with what I, I believe to a very constructive and important insight. And that is that ideology and situation are not opposites, that they are intertwined, uh, that you construct the situation that you're in to pay, to pay, uh, dependent upon the, the uh, cultural and ideological assumptions that you bring with you. Uh, and these two cannot be compartmentalized uh, in the way that some of the people who had read both Goldhagen's book and my book uh, had done, uh, and which I had not articulated because there was nothing to, in a sense, measure it against when I wrote in 92. After Goldhagen's book, it became possible then uh, to work on this issue of a, of a false binary that hadn't been there uh, when my book was, was first published. And finally, uh, there was a criticism that uh, I had been duped by my sources. Uh, the men giving these testimonies, of course, were subject to a judicial investigation. And that we had historians that faced a twofold problem in reading these interrogations. On the one hand, these interrogations were taken 20 years after the event. And we know that human memory is frail. We know that human memory plays tricks on us, uh, that we all over time reinvent uh, our memories of our past experience, uh, reinvent who we are in relation to our past, uh, and that memory is fluid, memory is frail, a memory is manipulable. Uh, and so working on testimonies of men in 1962 telling us what they did in 1942 is already a very problematic historical source. When you add to that, uh, that they have a motive uh, to, uh, to, in a sense, uh, cover much of what they did because they are subject to incriminating themselves if they say certain things, uh, that will distort uh, the testimony even further. Under German law, uh, someone who carried out routine killing could not be convicted of murder, but if he carried out that killing on the basis of hatred of the object of the sub of the person he was killing, if he admitted to, a, to an anti-Semitic ideology, uh, what would have been manslaughter becomes murder. Uh, and so the men had every motive uh, to, in a sense, disguise uh, any of their anti-Semitic feelings, uh, to hide their Nazi affiliations or their, their self-identity with Nazism, uh, and to portray themselves as simply uh, sort of politically neutered cogs in the machine uh, that had no feelings about what they were doing uh, and uh, were simply, uh, you know, not in effect ideological uh, actors. Uh, and so the historian working through these testimonies uh, is faced with challenges as how do you deal with these testimonies given those two sources of distortion. Goldhagen's answer was the following. You do not use any testimony that has the potential to be self-exculpatory. Any testimony that has the potential to let the perpetrator off the hook uh, must be dismissed as possibly contaminated. And you use only the testimony that is so self-incriminating uh, that you know you can rely upon it uh, because the person is not trying to, to, to exculpate himself. My feeling was that that was uh, a much uh, too high a, uh, a threshold uh, for the historian and also would distort uh, in a different way what we were trying to find out. 
my argument was as follows. And in fact, this testimony was of sort of three categories. There was testimony that was so mendacious, so transparently filled with lies that Goldhagen and I both would immediately dispense with it. Uh, anybody reading it knew this person was not telling the truth. There were testimonies that were so self-incriminating, so extraordinary in what they were admitting on the part of the perpetrators that they had no motive at all uh, to say what they were doing unless it was true, no reason for us uh, to dismiss it. But there was a broad band of testimony that told some of the truth some of the time, uh, and in particular told truth about what the battalion was doing, even if it didn't tell, tell the truth about what the individual in, in telling it was doing. That is, they were willing to talk about uh, what the unit was doing, even if they didn't admit fully to their own uh, crimes in participation in that wider picture. And it was that middle band of testimony that Goldhagen did not want to use, but that I thought we had to use. It had to be used, used carefully, but it was so rich with, uh, with information uh, that not to use it was in effect uh, to, uh, you know, to throw away uh, the baby with the bathwater. Indeed, not to use it would subject you to the following. Goldhagen's argument, in a sense, his hypothesis, was that the killers are ideologically driven uh, eliminationist anti-Semites. And his rule in evidence was, well, I will not use any evidence in which basically the perpetrator doesn't admit that he'd given himself body, mind, and soul to Hitler. Uh, and what results, of course, is that using only that testimony, uh, which portrays who you think, who by your hypothesis you think the killers are, you can do no other than confirm the hypothesis the evidence should be used to test. You can't come up with any other answer than your hypothesis is true if you only use the testimony of self-confessed Nazi killers to prove the conclusion that all the killers are self-confessed Nazis, or are not self-confessed, but are hardcore Nazi and anti-Semites. Uh, so that uh, it's a flawed methodology that can do nothing other than confirm the hypothesis evidence uh, should be testing. And only by using the middle band of testimony uh, do you come up with the variety and the spectrum of behavior that I did uh, that I think was much truer uh, to what had actually happened. Now, in this case, we can, in fact, uh, <laughs> Uh, put this to the test, uh, which of us was using the evidence uh, in the uh, more insightful way uh, by looking for examples, looking for evidence, looking for sources that are not dependent upon uh, the post-war uh, policeman. What other sources can we find that will in fact uh, give us a, a reading, give us a counter check on whether my conclusion or his conclusion was more accurate. And let me give you just one example, as if we bring in a, a, a evidence from a very different kind and lay that alongside how I, I read the testimony and Goldhagen read the testimony and see what we come up with. One of the things, conclusions I had met is the, is the battalion had broken into three groups, eager killers, the, the compliers, and the evaders. And his response immediately was, if you had anything like that kind of number of people not participating, it would have been a dysfunctional killer unit. It couldn't have possibly done what it did without solidarity among the killers. Well, uh, let's look at a different kind of evidence uh, to bring to bear on that different, those different conclusions. Uh, uh, one, one possibility of this is someone who was not in one of these police battalions, but nonetheless can see them from the inside. And this brings us uh, to the case of Oswald Rufheisen. Oswald Rufheisen was a young Jew from Silesia, the borderland between Poland and Germany. Uh, and uh, this is an area of Poland, uh, which had been under the Habsburgs, in fact, before World War I. And Oswald Rufheisen spoke German and Polish. This was a bilingual area uh, with perfect Polish, perfect German, unlike further east in Poland, where Jews spoke Yiddish as their family language. And whenever they spoke Polish, uh, they spoke it with a Yiddish accent. And uh, anybody, uh, any of the Polish neighbors could immediately tell uh, that they were Jewish and not uh, not Poles or not non-Jewish Poles. 
uh, Rufheisen, uh, when the Germans came into Silesia, fled there to Lithuania. And then in 1941, of course, the Germans invade Lithuania and Rufheisen flees south into what we now call Belarus uh, to the town of Mir. Uh, and there he was intercepted by a man named Simeon Serafimovich, who was the police cap, local native police captain of the police uh, force in Mir, who asked him for his papers. Uh, and Rufheisen said he had lost his papers. So they'd been stolen, which was not unreasonable. And so uh, uh, Serafimovich asked him who he is, and he says uh, he is uh, a refugee from, uh, from Silesia, which he was, uh, with a mixed parentage, half German, half Polish. And since he could speak Polish and German flawlessly, this seemed to be very uh, plausible. And uh, Serafimovich, who knew that Germans were going to send a police unit to Mir within several weeks and set up a police station, knew he needed an interpreter uh, and so he basically takes the 17-year-old Rufheisen and says, come with me, puts him up in a room in his own house. So he sleeps in the house of the Belarusian police captain at night and is serving as his interpreter in, in, during the day. The Germans come to town. Uh, this is a 13-man police unit to set up a police station made up of middle-aged reservists, almost exactly the comp composition of Reserve Police Battalion 101. North German Protestants of about 40 years old, under a man named Sergeant Hein. Well, Sergeant Hein meets with Serafimovich uh, and uh, they converse and immediately uh, Sergeant Hein decides this young Polish German 17 year old is such a good translator, he wants him to work for him. So here you have Oswald Rufheisen living with the Belarusian police captain at night, taking his meals and sitting at the right hand of the German Sergeant uh, in town by day, inside the German uh, police station, conducting all of its business with the local Belarusians uh, and doing all the translation work for Sergeant Hein. For eight months, he sees the German police from inside. He has a vantage point that virtually no Jewish survivor will ever have uh, because he's successfully passing and serving as a translator. Rufheisen survives the war. Uh, after the war, he and I were both uh, witnesses at the trial of Serafimovich in England, so that's when I got to know him. I interviewed him later in Haifa, uh, shortly before he died, uh, and uh, 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 Nahama Tech also interviewed him extensively and wrote a book about him. So we have Rufheisen's story. Now, what does Rufheisen say about the internal dynamics of the German middle-aged policeman, police reservists in Mir? He said they broke into three groups. Out of the 13, four of them were eager killers, men that went out and shot Jews and came back and boasted about what they had done at lunch uh, and uh, were proud of it and eager to do it. A middle group of five men uh, would do as they were ordered. He called them the passive executioners of orders. Uh, but uh, while they may have in uh, had been proud about going on anti-partisan actions, acting as soldiers. Uh, they came back from Jewish expeditions, as he said, uh, ashamed, silent, not wanting to talk about it, doing something as if it had been dirty, was, was Rufheisen's term, that they didn't want to do this, they did it anyway. And then there were four men in the battalion that assumed that they didn't have to take part in Jewish actions, never took part in Jewish actions, and nothing happened to them at all. So he confirmed uh, from his own vantage point exactly the conclusions about the internal dynamic and division that had taken place in Reserve Police Battalion 101 without all of the, in that sense, confirming that I had worked my way through this problematic evidence uh, much more accurately uh, than, than Goldhagen did. Well, those were the kinds of arguments that, that revolved in the 1990s. And then the question is, where have things gone since then? Uh, and I would say there, there are sort of uh, several developments uh, that have taken place that I would like to mention, just give you two examples. One is, of course, that we have begun a much more comparison between Holocaust perpetrators, Holocaust as a genocide, and other genocides. And uh, in particular, work on Rwanda uh, has been uh, enabled us to, in a sense, uh, look uh, in, in some detail on uh, the similarities and differences between these two genocides. 
And it was my good fortune uh, to be a visiting scholar at the Holocaust Museum in Washington, DC in 2002, 2003. At the same time, there was a visiting scholar there from Rwanda who was a psychiatrist. His name was Athanasa Hagen-Gamana. Uh, and uh, he had, uh, he was a man of extraordinary background. He was half Hutu, half Tutsi. It was a mixed product of mixed marriage. One of his sisters was in jail as a Hutu genocidaire. One of his sisters had been killed as a, as a Tutsi. So here's a man who was just caught right in the middle of, the, of this uh, genocidal conflict. After the genocide, the first thing he did was uh, to work in the refugee camps on the Uganda border, trying to use his psychiatric skills uh, to, of course, heal the trauma of the survivors. Also in this town was a prison holding a number of the, uh, of the arrested Hutu genocidaire. And it occurred to him that this was a unique opportunity for someone of his training to in fact uh, uh, deal with not only the survivors, but to deal with the perpetrators. And he got permission to go into the prison uh, and to circulate a questionnaire uh, that basically asked the, the prisoners to confess to the degree in which they had been implicated in the killing. Uh, and uh, a spectrum of answers came back, but a surprising number of the prisoners did indeed admit to being deeply implicated hardcore uh, genocidal killers. Now, clearly there were some that probably were really bad killers that didn't admit to it, but the pool that he had wasn't going to have people who weren't. It was going to be a pure, even if not incomplete pool now to work with. And he gave that group, the self-confessed, deeply implicated killers, a second questionnaire composed of all the questions he could think of that would reveal different kinds of motivations. And a uh, quite lengthy questionnaire. When it came back, he said, never in his professional experience had he seen anything quite like this. Almost all the questions had a flat line, non-correlation response, and then two clusters of, of, of explanations simply shot off the chart uh, with extraordinary degrees of correlation. So what are the two clusters of questions? Uh, one cluster dealt with the ideological side, the capacity to dehumanize your victims, to look at what you're doing as not killing other human beings, uh, but engaged uh, in killing cockroaches, engaged in sanitizing, purifying, uh, uh, and so forth, but not to admit to yourself that you are engaged in the act of murder uh, because the people you are killing are not really human beings and therefore what you are doing is not really, uh, does not make you a mass murderer. So you ideologically frame what you were doing to dehumanize your victims and therefore to construct what you were doing as something other than the act of murder. The second cluster of questions uh, revolved around uh, issues of esteem and self-esteem. Had they been held in high regard by their comrades? Uh, did their comrades value them? Did they view them as doing their share of being leaders, of having being go-getters, uh, being exemplary in their zeal uh, and in their uh, tireless uh, actions in killing others? Uh, had they been uh, the exemplary genocidaire uh, that uh, were that uh, you know as part of this killing unit society. So, uh, in a sense, the two clusters did uh, were around these two issues. One was the ideological issue of how do you frame what you're doing, uh, and the second was uh, the one that uh, shaped what you were doing in terms of your fitting into the unit, the dynamic, and above all, that you were held in high regard by those around you, that your esteem, your self-esteem is upheld uh, in the eyes of, of the other members of the unit. So I found uh, this fascinating because it, I think, uh, was very similar uh, to uh, the, the, the issues that I had raised in Ordinary Men. Uh, a second uh, uh, approach that I think, uh, in addition to the comparative one, uh, is the one uh, among many uh, scholars that tries to go beyond our singular focus on anti-Semitism. Because of course, what became uh, increasingly apparent as we did more and more perpetrator studies uh, is that not all the killers were German and not all the victims were Jews. 
uh, and that many of these people uh, were equal opportunity killers uh, that uh, killed not only Jews, but mentally handicapped and Roma and Russian prisoners of war uh, and local villagers and so on and so forth. Uh, and that we had to find out something that explained their actions that went beyond what had been our rather singular focus on anti-Semitism to a broader uh, ideological explanation, or at least a broader perceptual one of how uh, they uh, viewed what they were doing. And also not only what they were against, but what they were for. I mean, we always said the Nazis are anti-Semitic, anti-Bolshevik, anti-Slavic, uh, but what were the positive things that harnessed them? Uh, what did they themselves conceive themselves uh, in favor of? Uh, and uh, I would say the scholar who's done the best work on this uh, is Thomas Kuna uh, from Clark University. And he's written several books looking at uh, the crucial uh, concepts that had broad resonance in German society that the Nazis were able to appropriate and to racialize, to incorporate them in and to, in a sense, adapt them to Nazi racial ideology and to use to mobilize people, harness people in uh, such an effective way uh, in, in uh, the occupation in Eastern Europe. One of his books was on comradeship and his other was on what the German term Volksgemeinschaft, which is a German term that has lots of uh, possible translations. None of them is exact in English, but uh, under the Nazis, this becomes the racial community, the sense of community being based above all on racial ethnic uh, identity, uh, not on some other elements that would create an imagined community if we want to go back uh, to Benedict Arnold, uh, to, uh, <laughs> but these other notions about what gives national sense of belonging and national community. Um, and uh, basically then uh, Kuna was saying that uh, if we, we have to widen our scope, go beyond anti-Semitism, this is part of it, but it's not the full picture. Uh, and it was the Nazi capacity in effect to mobilize people uh, in not only a negative way, what are they against, but in a positive way, what are they for? Uh, a sense of belonging to the community uh, by comradeship, belonging to the community uh, by a sense of racial identity and, and racial common, uh, common belonging. Uh, and that uh, this would enable them to create a world uh, in which their community of obligation was that of the Germans and no one else. Uh, and so what had been for, uh, you know, a, a sense of a, a sense of morality that previously at least had been partially universal. Uh, Thou shalt not kill, of course, applies to everyone. What the Nazis had managed to do was to create a moral world that applied only to Germans, that your moral obligations were only to Germans and not to others, so that you could decouple the persecution, dispossession, and murder of Jews from any sense of either criminality or immorality. Uh, and that while they might, uh, unlike Goldhagen, and it wasn't, they did it because they wanted to, but they would do what they didn't find particularly pleasant, but not think of it as an act of criminality or immorality uh, in that circumstance. So uh, I think that's the, the direction I would say uh, that perpetrator studies has gone in the immediate post, uh, post well, since the turn of the millennium and post 2000, where we've gotten beyond the narrow argument between myself and Goldhagen and broadened it more uh, comparatively and broadened it more in our concepts of what in German culture indeed did Germans bring to the situation uh, that can help explain why they behave the way they did. With that, I will stop. Uh, and I guess Lloyd is going to uh, field questions for us. Thank you so much, uh, Chris. You brought in so many issues and I appreciate all of your perspectives. We have been receiving a number of questions. We have already at least 13. <laughs> I don't know if we'll be able to get through all of these. We may go over just a little bit to include uh, as many as we can. The first one is from Ray Falk and it has to do with the question of how people deal with these horrors after they're over. 
with things like truth and reconciliation commissions. Is there any possibility that one can see a similar coming to terms in the United States with issues like systemic racism or separating immigrant children from their parents, things like that, that a culture has to come to terms with after it's taking place? Uh, yeah, I, I, was, I guess I would say, would say several things there. First, in terms of the men in the battalion itself, uh, I've often been asked, you know, do they feel remorse? Do they feel, do they have post-traumatic stress syndrome after they got back home? Uh, and the answer was no, uh, that when one reads through uh, the testimonies, the overwhelming sort of ethos of the testimonies is self-pity that they are double victims, that they were victims in 1942 when they were drafted and conscripted and sent to do the dirty work. And it was left to them among various Germans. They got the worst assignment and they were stuck with the dirty work in 1942. And then 20 years later, they changed the rules, made that into a crime. And now they're, be, now they're in court uh, and being accused of being Nazi murderers. Poor them, uh, what a bad deal they got that the victim is simply outside their whole frame of reference. They don't talk about the victims. It's not even there. Uh, that their focus is so self-centered and so much on how badly they got dealt uh, that there is really no engagement with, uh, with, with the victim of what they did. So it's very hard to have a kind of self you know, a, a reconciliation if you don't even in effect recognize that you're the perpetrator and they're the victim rather than that you're the double victim. Mm -hmm. uh, so for Germany, of course, I think as a society, I think it's done very well in coming to grips with its past history in terms of, of Germany accepting that this was done, say in, in contrast, say to Turkey, which still denies the Armenian mass you know, genocide. Uh, in, in comparison to Japan, where you have these fierce fights over textbooks and so forth. The Germans have done a remarkable job of uh, dealing with this in terms of public monuments, in terms of, 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 of teaching and their school curriculums. But the perpetrators themselves, I don't think, have come to grips with this. I, I don't think you find hardly any evidence that they consider uh, that what they have done uh, is something which they have to come to grips with through some kind of confession, some kind of, uh, 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 of uh, remorse uh, uh, that they're in need of redemption. Uh, that I just don't feel that vibe anywhere uh, in, 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 in what they've said after the war. So we may have similar challenges in the United States. I think that was the point of that. That yeah, in the sense that that, uh, that the people who need it most are the ones who feel the need for it least. Uh, mm -hmm. I guess this is discouraging. <laughs> the the discouraging problem. That, that's a very rich issue that we may come back to. Uh, this is a second question from Carla Nance, who says, I am a high school history teacher who teaches an elective called Holocaust and the Genocide in World Studies to mostly 11th and 12th graders. I'm curious to know how you might want teachers to use your book um, and, and how, what major takeaways do you think that they would, you would want them to carry away from that? In other words, what should teachers focus on? Yeah, I think the most important sort of uh, takeaway from the book is to not distance ourselves from the perpetrators as some sort of abnormal or crazy or sadistic human beings that we couldn't be. Uh, if one of the issues is, you know, how do we uh, cope with the world today, one of them is to, to at least become aware of what our capacities are as human beings. And that is not to hide from ourselves that this was done by what I call ordinary men, but one of the best ways to make sure ordinary men don't do that again is to be aware of what are ordinary men capable of. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, to, uh, in that sense, uh, we have to accept that we can't distance ourselves from these people as being totally different from us, uh, and or to see them as sort of totally abnormal freaks that uh, that uh, we we would we would never have done in those circumstances what they did. So, if we have a, an awareness of our own vulnerabilities uh, and the vulnerabilities of, of humans as part of human nature. 
then uh, that is an important uh, step to, uh, to how we conduct ourselves, what are our civic and, uh, and human responsibilities. So if I had, had a takeaway, I hope that people you know, took from the book, that would certainly be, I think, the most salient. Do you know, has the book been used also in high school courses around the world or in Germany itself? I don't, I know it's been used in high school courses in the United States. I don't know whether it's been used in high school courses around the world. It has been used at the military academies. It has been used at West Point and Annapolis and, and in the Colorado Springs. Uh, and so uh, that's very heartening that, uh, that uh, this is part of uh, the military's own self-awareness. Uh, of the kinds of things they have to make their officers uh, aware of. So uh, you, awareness is in a sense the first step to, to making the right decisions and evaluating the situations that they're in correctly. So as, as we mentioned at the beginning, there is now a requirement to teach something about the Holocaust in North Carolina schools. So we'll hope that your book will become part of that teaching. I want to move on to another uh, question. This is from Rose Horswill. It says, at the start of your remarks, you mentioned how your work fits into the field of perpetrator studies. Have you come across comparative groups apart from the Nazis where this idea of ordinary men significantly impacted events? Is, is this a common pattern whenever horrific events take place, the patterns you saw with the Nazis? Yeah. Um, well, we certainly don't know about other genocides to the same degree as we do about Germany. One, because the documentation of Germany survived and was captured in much greater degrees. And then the Germans conducted trials in a much greater degree than any other uh, country that's committed this kind of crime. So uh, Rwanda became, in a sense, uh, the, the, the first one genocide where you had the capacities to, to look at that in the kind of detail uh, that had been done with the Holocaust. And there, I think one of the things uh, I found from uh, the, the example I cited that uh, you find important parallels. Uh, we know very little, for instance, about the, the Pol Pot killers in Cambodia, uh, about uh, uh, the, uh, uh, you know, the Turkish and uh, Kurdish killers and the Armenian genocide. We just don't have the sources that allow us to do anything, I think, on that level. Uh, so uh, one, of the, one of the important things about the Holocaust is it being the most deep, the most researched, but also the best documented genocide, it allows us to find out at least some things that we can suspect, but can't prove about other genocides. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think with Rwanda, uh, we are on the way to a kind of comparative uh, framework. Uh, and so far, I think that's borne fruit. That's one of the interesting developments now, a great deal of interest in comparative genocidal yeah. studies, as, as gloomy yeah. as the subject is, but it's a very rich field right at the moment. This is a, a question from Jordan Diamond. When I first read your work, the language of cowards that these men use try, uh, stuck out to me. Do you think that masculinity and the desire to present oneself as masculine among the other men was a factor in complicity? Or just their fear of being asocial. Uh, no, I think I think uh, masculinity was indeed uh, part of how they understood themselves. But we have, must understand how masculinity and femininity, toughness and weakness, are coded. Uh, and that is to be tough enough to kill people was voted was coded as masculine. And to be too weak to kill was, was coded in a sense as feminine. One of the men testified afterwards since, you know, the men, the, the, the officers would, would assign people on these, on these uh, killing assignments, uh, but they never asked me to do it uh, because they wanted only men and they considered me no man. Mm -hmm. uh, but the irony of that, of course, is the people that were strong enough to have the moral autonomy to say no are considered weak. And the people that are so weak they go along and conform are coded as male and tough. So this is part of the Nazi inverted world. Mm -hmm. uh, and the Nazis had this capacity to create an inverted moral world. The other way in which they did that, for instance, was, and we have, this is a quote, say, from the commanding officer in Serbia when he's sending his troops out to carry out these horrific reprisal 
uh, sweeps because of the, the partisans under Tito were causing so much trouble. And they had to, as he put it, make the entire civilian population the target. All the civilian population must suffer. Basically saying there is no civilian non-combatant combatant distinction. And he basically then said, anyone who is weak against the enemy sins against the life of his comrades. To not kill non-combatants is the sin. Hmm. Uh, to re refuse to kill non-combatants, uh, that's immoral. So you turn morality totally on its head. Uh, and it's this inverted moral world the Nazis were able to create in both these ways. What was tough, what was weak, what was moral, what was immoral, it's just upside down. That's a very interesting point that to be manly means to just go along with what other people tell you to do. <laughs> this is a question by Lee Nachman. If the Vader group that you described had refused to participate indirectly, what would have happened to them? If they had criticized the regime directly, what would have happened to them? Would they have been labeled as traitors and shot? Yeah, the, 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 there, from what I've seen, there is a line. You can say, I won't do that. And basically you're left alone. Uh, you may be considered as I say, a week in the battalion where you're not gonna get promoted. Uh, but nothing is going to happen to you in terms of draconic punishment. The line you cannot cross, and where I've seen people actually brought to court martial by the Nazis, is not for re refusing to shoot on our men and children, women and children. That's not what they punish you for. But if you cross the line and try to persuade your comrades to join you in not doing it, then mm -hmm. you are court martialed. You're not court martialed for disobeying an order. You're court martialed for subverting morale. And that they don't mind having a written record of. You're trying to subvert the battalion, subvert its solidarity, and undermine its mission. Uh, so you can be a loner and get out of it. What you can't try to do is recruit others to that position uh, to try to act in concert. Mm -hmm. Individuals don't bother the regime. Opposition in concert does bother the regime, and that's where they draw the line. Interesting. Okay. This is a question from Sharon Halperin, who uh, notes that deference to authority and hoping to conform are understandable explanations. Can you include fear as an explanation for these behaviors? Uh, not fear of punishment. That is, they weren't. They knew they weren't going to be. Once the once the major made clear that you couldn't be forced to do this, uh, they knew they were not going to suffer disciplinary punishment. What they did fear was ostracism, uh, fear being shut out by their comrades. Uh, because who else do they have? I mean, this is a 500-man German community in the middle of Poland, and doing occupation on a foreign territory is a pretty lonely duty. You don't make friends with the local population. Uh, so it is, there's fear, but it's a fear of ostracism. It's a fear of loneliness. It's a fear of being uh, uh, the, uh, the, the pariah of the battalion, not fear of a disciplinary action of, of being sent to a, you know, concentration camp uh, or anything of that sort. Fear of being shunned as it were, something like that. Yes. Um, this is a, a, another question. This is from Ariel Wilkes. Do you see Hannah Arendt's idea of the banality of evil evidenced um, in your work? How do you believe your findings compare with the findings of Hannah Arendt? Yeah, uh, I would say the following. I think I think the concept of banality of evil, as she defines it, not as it was understood by others. Too many people reacted and said she was saying evil was banal. She wasn't saying evil is banal. She says that evil is committed by banal people. And indeed, for her, the great mystery of the Holocaust was how could such a calamitous evil be committed by such stunningly banal perpetrators? Mm -hmm. uh, and certainly I found that. I mean, many of the people I study are, are these 40-year-old conscripts off the streets of, of Hamburg, and they're becoming, in effect, professional killers. Where I think Hannah Arendt was wrong was using Eichmann as an example of a banal killer. Eichmann's defense strategy in Jerusalem was to disguise himself as a mediocre bureaucrat, a cog in the machine. And in fact, Eichmann was an SS go-getter and a highly ideologically motivated Nazi fanatic. He, he, 
he tried to disguise himself as the uh, you know the the banal bureaucrat precisely because there were so many banal bureaucrats that this became a plausible shield to hide behind. Uh, and I think she got suckered by his defense. But the concept of the, the, the banality of evil, I think was, was quite valid. Her example of it was a mistake. Mm -hmm. Thank you. OK, uh, this is a question from Jonathan Gerard. He has a, a more general question. He points out that nations all through history have used the forces at their disposal to attack and defeat their enemies and commit horrific things. The Holocaust represents the use of the most modern techniques. On the other hand, anti-Semitism in general and the show in particular are seen by many as unique and without rationality or self-interest. As a rabbi, I am occasionally called to struggle between these two points of view. Can you help me with this? How should I understand the Shoah? I think, is this a, a, an utterly unique event or something that is recognizable? Um, I would say is the following, uh, that, I, that I think that the Holocaust is a genocide, that is, it falls under a broader rubric of the attempt to wipe out an entire ethnic, religious, or national group, uh, to erase the identity of an entire you know, group. Uh, in that sense, it shares commonality with other genocides. Mm -hmm. uh, at the same time, like any historical event, it has identifiers, particularities, singularities that make it the event it was. We have lots of wars, but World War II is different than the War of the American Revolution. Uh, and uh, for me, the three key uh, ways in which the Holocaust uh, is different from other genocides. As one, as the rabbi said, it's the most modern one committed by the most advanced uh, economic, scientific, uh, industrial nation, using all of the, uh, the capacities of a modern administrative state uh, and the technologies of a modern scientific society uh, to carry out the genocide. We can have almost equally horrific genocides without that. As Rwanda showed, you could kill 800,000 people in three months with machetes. Uh, but the Holocaust was in, different than that in the sense that it was attempted to be done in the most modern way. Uh, secondly, I, I would say most genocides take place within a national framework uh, that the enemy is, is seen as within the nation. Uh, the Holocaust, the, for the Nazis, the Jew universally was to be hunted down everywhere, all over Europe. Uh, certainly, if they'd gotten to the Middle East, as Hitler assured the Mufti, if we got there, we'd kill the Jews there. And certainly no reason to believe that if Hitler had managed to go beyond that, he wouldn't have killed every Jew anywhere that ever fell within the Nazi grasp. So it was a genocide without any limits. Uh, and so it wasn't just the, the threat of German Jews to the German state, it was the very existence of Jews anywhere in the world that were conceived of uh, and uh, as a existential threat to Germany. Thirdly, I would say most genocides come out of some real conflict. That is Hutus and Tutsis, for instance, for a long time, uh, and we can say this, we can blame this on the Belgians as a result of colonial categorization or whatever, but there was a real conflict between Hutus and Tutsis. There was a real conflict between Armenian aspirations uh, for self-determination and Turkish notions of what was essential uh, for the, the defense of the, of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, and these conflicts had, in a sense, a long history to them, uh, and that the genocide almost invariably is done, uh, it was, was conceived of by the perpetrator as an act of self-defense. If we don't do it to them, they will do it to us. Our survival depends upon us doing it first. What I think distinguishes the Holocaust is that this uh, self-defense against the Jew is a self-defense against an utterly imaginary fantastical threat. German Jews are the most patriotic nationalistic Germans anywhere you could find. Uh, the fact, the notion that somehow Germany's existential, you know, uh, hang, existence hangs on whether you can kill a two-year-old Jewish baby in the Ukraine is madness. It's, it's just a fantastical imagined threat that has no basis in any kind of reality at all. 
so in that sense, the degree to which this is a genocidal reaction against a totally imaginary fantasized threat, uh, I think exists to a greater degree than I found in any other genocide that we can look at. Uh, so I would say, yes, the Holocaust is a genocide. In that sense, it's not unique, but it does have unique features, which we can identify, that make it a particular historical event uh, and a very significant one. Okay, thank you very much. We, we've come to the time at which we had planned to adjourn, but I do have a few more questions I'd like to explore if you're able to go just a little bit longer. I can. Um, and I, I want to thank Paul Bonici, who is our wonderful facilitator for all this and manages all of these questions. This is I'm, I'm clapping for Paul Bonici and thank you, Paul. Mm -hmm. But a couple of more questions here. Do you have advice? This is a question from Kara Irvin. Do you have advice for graduate students interested in studying Nazi ideology and perpetrators? How do we study and write about these ideas to better understand, and the men who acted in these ways, to better understand their motivations and their so-called logic without sanitizing or excusing their crimes? How do we study them? Well, I would say, uh, uh, you know, to, uh, to understand is, is not to forgive, to explain is not to excuse. Uh, to be empathetic is not to be sympathetic. Uh, an historian does have to place themselves in to some degree in the historical time and the historical people that he, is, that he or she is studying uh, because we always have that, that, that dual perspective. How did the people we're looking at understand the world where they, they were in? How did they read their, their, their situation? And yet, what perspective can we bring from the critical distance that we have of hindsight uh, and documentation uh, that we can now look at that the historical actors themselves you know, did not have access to? So we're always doing that, 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 that double perspective of how can we insert ourselves as much as possible into the world that we're studying, but not surrender the exterior perspective that we gain uh, from research after the fact and hindsight after the fact. So uh, it, is, it is a balancing act. Uh, and uh, one of the things, of course, one of the, one of the criticisms of ordinary men was I had not balanced properly. I had tipped too far uh, into exculpation, too far into empathy with uh, the, the perpetrators. Uh, but I think that was the minority reaction. I think many more people thought that, uh, that I had gotten the balance as was needed. Uh, and uh, there is no magic formula for that, uh, that basically uh, one just has to, uh, I think, use one's common sense and one's sense of decency in trying to be you know, fair to the people we're studying, trying to, in a sense, let them speak for themselves, but not to excuse it, not to whitewash it, but to nonetheless give them a hearing. Uh, we can't understand them if we don't listen to what they have to say, and we don't try to make what they have to say explicable, expl you know, explicable to people now, a uh, hundred years later, or in a much different world. That's sort of the general problem with all historical studies. That's, yeah, this is this is this is a problem. You know, it may be it may we... have a sharper cutting edge when you're dealing with Nazi perpetrators, exactly. but it is the universal problem that historians yeah, have. How do we take seriously people whose values differ? from our own, but yet we have to engage with it somehow. Yeah. Uh, this is a question from David Weiner about the, the role of how what makes a unit effective. Is there a fit between the leader and the unit in terms of charisma? Does the leader of a unit play a key role? Mm -hmm. Or what about the close alignment among the group members and comradeship? Yeah. You, can you discern difference mm -hmm. in that respect? Yes, yeah, certainly. Uh, I think the studies we've done, particularly the role, say, of Major Trop in, in this particular battalion, uh, command uh, is an important ingredient. Uh, and uh, one of our graduate students from North Carolina, Waitman Bourne, who did dissertation there, now teaches uh, at uh, Newcastle University in England. Uh, one of the case studies he found was, in fact, a, a uh, I want to get my unit right. Uh, I guess it was a battalion that had three companies in which they received uh, the, the order to 
assist the SS in carrying out a killing in this village. And one of the company commanders said no. And one of the commanders, the company commanders equally said yes. And the other sort of hemmed and hawed uh, and waited until he saw which way he could somehow maneuver uh, and uh, try to find a kind of inconspicuous way to work his way out of it. Uh, and so here you had the exact situation receiving the same orders and three commanders responding in three different ways. And that meant that the men in those units basically went through this in very three different ways. Uh, so command, you know, a small unit command does play a crucial role in the unit's culture and how it is going to operate, uh, which is another reason why our understanding these things is very important because uh, commanders make decisions that are absolutely crucial, not just for themselves, but all the men under their command. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's very difficult to break apart all of those details, but they do make a difference in some way. Yes, yeah, what we do, what generalization we can make is that yes, one important variable is the unit commander. Mm -hmm. This is a question from Lindsay Eileen, um, one of our graduate students. Do you believe there is a way to reform the cultures of police or military units to make individuals less susceptible to committing violence or murder against civilian, or is the potential always baked into them because of structures, their general purpose, and group psychology? In other words, are the structures themselves yeah. the issue? Uh, no, I would say the vulnerability is always there, which is why police training and military training has to be very self-conscious and very targeted to make sure that does not happen. That is, uh, we, we can't just assume human beings don't do those kinds of things. <laughs> uh, we do have to be aware that this is in fact, uh, a, a under certain pressures and circumstances, this is a very likely response. And therefore we have to make people aware, train them to be very aware that this is what they have to guard against. So certainly I think in police training, uh, we have to, to be very uh, focused on that, very targeted on that. Uh, apparently, uh, in, in New Orleans, when they were doing police training, as, uh, the woman who was sort of trying to head uh, the, ref the reform movement there was holding workshops and she used ordinary men. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, some of the police came in and uh, she told me this story. She said, well, they said, oh, it's a very good book, but what does Poland have to do with us? It was hard for them to make the connection and see what the relevance was. So, uh, and I hope after they did their workshop that that that, that this became more apparent. Uh, but we do have to be very targeted and very focused on that. It's not inevitable. Uh, I think we can train people to 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 understand uh, that this is a danger and this is what we have to guard against. And what we almost must always be conscious as something that we don't want to, in a sense. Uh, uh, get loose. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, we, we aren't going to have time to answer all the questions because they just keep coming in, but I do want to pose two or three more and then we'll have to bring this to a conclusion. Uh, this is from Jonathan Molino. Would you explain more fully how your initial social psychological explanation was affected by your subsequent rejection of the polarizing distinction between ideology and context. When you came to that later perception, did that affect your earlier social psychological explanation? Uh, no, I don't think so. Uh, because the social psych, I mean, I, in, the, in, the, in the conclusion, I always said, there is no one answer to this. This is, a, this, first of all, we're dealing with 500 people in a battalion and they're all individuals and the historian even trying to make a, a generalization about a group of 500 men is taking a certain license uh, and must always be aware that, that you have 500 individuals, all of them that were reacting in, in somewhat different ways and we mustn't forget their individuality, their own humanity. Uh, and I think in terms of, uh, and this is why I resisted the claim that social psychology was exculpatory, that it was somehow uh, if you invoke these, you were saying it was determinative and these people didn't make choices and didn't exercise human responsibility. So uh, for me, I, I thought I, I didn't find them in conflict. And when I, when I, but what I did, what the, what the latter, the contributions of Leonard Newman 
uh, I think were important because it at least helped me to understand how we understand situation and that indeed one of the reasons why different people in the same experiment react differently is they do come with different perceptions. They do come with different values. And it's all part of, of, of how they're going, say if we take the Milgram experiment uh, and uh, if you have a man with a clipboard and a white coat telling you to electrocute someone, uh, whether you find that compelling and, and, and something to which you, uh, however uncomfortable you are, you're going to go ahead and do, or whether you're going to decide that uh, that's not something I'm going to take part with, is going to be shaped by the values you bring. And in a sense, the degree to which you have already used to exercising what I call moral autonomy. Mm -hmm. The habits of, of, of getting used to the fact that sometimes you have to say no. Uh, and the degree to which you, you, you realize, I don't always have to say yes. I don't always have to please my superiors. Uh, I don't always have to go along. The better equipped you are uh, in these situations to not uh, get manipulated and, and harnessed to things that you don't want to take part in. Um, OK, two, two final questions. Are you familiar with the book, No, no Ordinary Men? and comment on Bonhoeffer and Hans von Doinanyi. Do you know the a book called uh, Ordinary Men? No, I don't know the book. I mean, I, I know some of, of Bonhoeffer and Doinanyi, but uh, they were you know, in the German res resistance, but yeah, uh, yeah. I don't know. I mean, I assume yeah. they're saying that these two were the opposite of ordinary men. Exactly. Which is exactly they were not that. ordinary men. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, these were, pe these were people of, of extraordinary degree of moral autonomy. <laughs> yeah. So they represent exactly what if more people could be like that, the world would be a different place. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. It's it's it's, uh, it's Bonhoeffer that articulates. I mean, for many Germans, they they wanted to be you know good Christians, good human beings. They wanted to be good German patriots and good Nazis all at once, and refused to understand that times you have to make choices. And it's Bonhoeffer that articulated this. You you could be a good Christian. Uh, and a good defender of Western civilization, but you then had to work for the defeat of your country, or you could be a good German, a good Nazi, but you had to accept the destruction of Western civilization and Christianity. You couldn't have it both ways. Uh, and very few Germans had that clarity uh, and insisted you had to make a choice. This is why the humanities are so useful for breaking <laughs> up the complexity. Um, I, I have to throw in one, one question here from Joanna Smith. Since the per perpetrators were all male, uh, what about their wives, mothers, daughters? Do you know any way about how they may have processed this information about their husbands? Um, yeah, uh, some of the men, some of the officers uh, were allowed to have their wives come and visit in the field, uh, and certainly one of the strangest. Uh, episodes I recount in the book is when one of the one of the company commanders who had, had was about to get married uh, and he had left his pregnant girlfriend when he sent to Poland uh, then uh, has her come out and visit him while he is conducting ghetto clearings and he brings her on the most lethal deadly ghetto clearing operation, which more than a thousand people are shot down in the streets of, of this town, Mienzircic, uh, and he brings her to watch. Uh, and uh, it, it's an astonishing story. And, and uh, part of the issue, uh, you know, as the, as the men were very, uh, didn't like this, the men were very uncomfortable having a civilian woman from Germany witnessing what they were doing. And they spoke quite negatively of this. Uh, because this this brought the home front and the home world, uh, you know, there, and they were trying to keep these two worlds separate. Uh, and she needed to say after the, during her later testimony, uh, told a story totally different than everybody else that that saw this. But there were some of the wives that came out, uh, and um, and and in fact, you know, we're we're interrogated as part of this investigation. Some of the other wives, one comment I remember uh, that one of the wives said, uh, once, once the, the, the trial started and this were all coming out, uh, now I understand why my husband was so different when he came back from the war. 
Mm-hmm. Now, I assume this is a problem with every war. I assume all sorts of Vietnam veterans came back and their marriages were quite different, that, you know, that they had changed sufficiently that many of the marriages broke up and, and the, the couples were no longer, uh, the rela- were no longer, it wasn't no, any longer the relationship that it existed before. Uh, but that at least was, uh, it, the, I think there was a fairly high divorce rate of, because people, uh, it, the man had changed enough that the marriage was not what it had been. So Fred Wasser related to this asked, what was the result of the trial of the members of the battalion? Or quite a few uh, punished. Initially, I think 11 men were put on trial for the first trial. I think two of them got ill enough that they were kind of excused during the trial. Of the nine men at the end, uh, four received prison sentences. On appeal, all of those prison sentences are reduced. So those four received, you know, uh, I think three, four, five, and six years. Uh, when that happened, the second trial being prepared, the uh, the prosecutor just just threw it up and said, "This is not worth it. If this is all we're going to get out of this, I'm not wasting the state's money on the second trial." Uh, so the punishment, the number of people guilty with guilty sentences was very small, and the punishments they received was very slap on the wrist, okay. which was not untypical of the trials. So final questions, I'm gonna combine something from Sharon Halper and, and Peter Stein. Um, Hello to Peter Stein. <laughs> you're, you know Peter Stein, right? <laughs> he, he, uh, yeah, he <laughs> audited my class. <laughs> um, and Sharon says, what do we tell our students today about genocide? They don't think they can make a difference. And then Peter's question, looking into your crystal ball, do you think future, where do you think future cases of mass killings will appear? If we um, do our job, maybe the students will help prevent it. But uh, those are the two questions. Yeah. Final question. uh, my fear is this, is that with climate change and global warming, you're going to have increasingly different places on the earth that become unable to support their current populations. Uh, that you're going to get desperately driven migration patterns as people. I mean, what happens when half of Bangladesh goes underwater and Muslims from Bangladesh move to over the border to India, where you have a Hindu nationalist government uh, that thinks they have too many Muslims already? That would be one example. I think that uh, that uh, the, the the danger of genocide will increase significantly as we have shrinking territory, shrinking resources, forced uh, migrations uh, that are viewed as invasions by others, uh, and the way in which this will be dealt with ultimately uh, is a genocidal destruction of uh, those who are viewed as the threat by those that have the power to commit it. Uh, so I, I, I'm a, my view of the future is that unless we get a handle on climate change, uh, we have a very dim future in this regard ahead of us. Well, thank you very much. I hope our students can make a difference somehow. And I want to thank you, uh, Chris Browning, for a wonderful presentation and for answering so many questions. I, I want to thank my colleague Ruth Van Bernuth for her leadership at the Center for Jewish Studies and Tom Oman for his support of this event, as well as all of our friends and supporters out there. I again want to thank Paul Benici for his work on the technical aspects of this. And let me just on a personal note say, Chris, how pl- what a great pleasure it is to see you again. <laughs> you are a wonderful colleague at Chapel Hill, and we miss having you here. We're sorry it didn't happen in person, but at least we feel reconnected through this event. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you all for being with us. This has been recorded so you can come back to it and look at it again and have a good evening to all of you. Good evening, bye-bye.